guys all comfortable? Okay, looks Carissa like DeFranco, a Middleton resident for the Salem Immigration Law Practice. The rating for Congress has hit a record low of 9%, in large part because of its handling of the budget and national debt. What would you do to break the logjam and restore public confidence in the, the way national we got legislature? It was actually by going out, making the case to the public about why it needed to be done, and getting people involved. I think the only way we break what's wrong in Washington is by involving more people, people in our elections and people in the issues. Thank I think you. that's how we make something happen. And, and I, as I was um, going to say, take the message to the people and stop capitulating. I am a commissioner on the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women, and the only thing that moves legislation is the people in the legislature and in the halls of Congress we took a bill that was dead for 11 years and we made 40 legislative visits, a very small group of three or four of us, and we got that bill out of committee. And with Democrats, you know, the public be agrees with us on so many issues, on maintaining Social Security, maintaining Medicare, investing in public jobs. They agree with us over and over again. And what Democrats do is they capitulate before they even begin the fight because they're too afraid to take the Republicans on and make them fight on our turf. That was a great way to the start. The Occupy no? movement has come to occupy the public imagination uh, with its emphasis on corporate corruption and massive economic inequality. Please give me a grade, A through F, for the Occupy movement nationally and a grade for how the movement is playing out in Boston, A through F. I could jump on that. Um, nationally, I would say B because I think for the most part, um, the idea is good. We have a long history of, of nonviolent civil disobedience. Which Excuse me. I'm going to just oh. ask you. When we ask mm -hmm. you for A to F, mm -hmm. go A to F. How about that? Just okay. give us a single letter rating. Oh, only A or F? A to F. Yes. So okay. I said a B. You said B. She I said no B. explanation. Oh, so I'm sorry. So B. Okay. Local. And, oh, Occupy Boston, A+. Plus. Each campaign. And uh, in this one, whoever wins this primary, they can expect millions to be tossed into this campaign by these outside groups, both for and against the candidate who's going to be facing Senator Brown. So far, Ms. Warren, you failed to denounce them or publicly ask them to cease and desist, which Brown publicly has done so. Is this the right strategy for Democrats? And I would I like all of you to I've been saying over and over again on the campaign trail for eight months is that Democrats are not going to win this race by making people hate Scott Brown. They have to make, we have to make people want to vote for the Democrat, not against Brown. And with attack ads, you reach a saturation point. You know, if you have a sponge in a bucket and you pour a gallon in, the sponge absorbs all the water. You pour another gallon of water in, it's reached a saturation point. So that's going to happen with attack ads. They're going to get sick of both candidates, and the people will ultimately decide. So I think it's a giant waste of money. And a race that's funded by 1% on both sides, the 99% loses. Jim, did you want to talk? Because uh, I've got uh, a couple today, of comments. Today, no one has been prosecuted for the actions that led to the collapse of the housing market, the implosion in the financial services industry, and the recession that followed. Why hasn't there been accountability? The SEC has done civil prosecutions, but the Department of Justice hasn't. And if you watch the interview with the, um, the Department of Justice attorney, he said, well, we're not sure. We're doing all we can if we can prove fr fraud in the intent. And, you know, really, come on. If you're the Department of Justice and you can't prove fraud in these cases, you know, do something else. Because it's just lack of political will from the top to the bottom. Sure. I'm glad, Elizabeth, that you're saying you don't excuse that, because as someone who fights the federal government on a shoestring bu budget, I'm a bit of a tougher critic on the federal government for holding back on, I, on prosecuting I, the bank. There's no excuse for what they have failed to do. And I agree it needs more funding. Do, they do need, need more funding, more. absolutely, with They need on that. more funding, absolutely. and they need more pressure from the public, but they also need to show the leadership to get out there, absolutely. do the investigations, Move and on. bring the um, prosecution. Mr. Well, Franco, yes. in 60 seconds or less, can you tell us what you believe is the greatest challenge facing the nation and the state? It is jobs. And the big difference between my candidacy and others and Scott Brown is that I will say loud and clear that the only solution to this crisis is for the federal government to invest in jobs, public jobs. If we put forward... <laughs> Thank you. $100 billion over the next two years, we would create 2 million green jobs. And by the way, $100 million is only half of, over a spread of two years, is only half of what corporations 
don't pay us in taxes every year because they are scoff laws on a million, a billion dollar, sorry, a hundred billion dollars a year in taxes. So I just want 50 billion of that to invest in green jobs, high speed rail, and put people back to work because then that will spur the private sector and they will see that the government is creating jobs and inventing things and making money. And then the private sector will say, we want a piece of this action. And that is the only thing that is going to get us out of this crisis. We deficit spent to defeat fascism and win World War II and we need to do it again. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a absolutely perfect segue. We, we were just saying that because this next question certainly relates to that. Green energy is a catchphrase, as you know, for the 21st, for 21st century technology. But what should be the role of the federal government in spurring growth in this area, especially in light of the Solandra loan fiasco? Now, I assume everyone's familiar with Solandra. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, how would you turn and how would you turn that support? into badly needed jobs for Massachusetts residents outside of Cambridge and outside of the 128 corridor. So I have two words for any Republican that throws Solyndra in our face, and that's deep water horizon. <laughs> so don't tell me, because you are going to have, you, you can't try, you, if you're afraid to fail, then you're not ever going to try anything, and we're going to get nowhere. And oil and gas and... <laughs> clean coal, which is an oxymoron, and safe fracking, which is a double oxymoron, if that exists, um, is, is ridiculous. And Democrats should fight hardball on this. And so Solyndra didn't work out. There's thousands and thousands of other projects that do work out. I was just in Fitchburg last week at a town meeting where they're building a solar farm. It's amazing. And, you know, I can't wait until they break ground to go see it. And we should be doing that across the state. And if we get serious about investing in high-speed rail, by the way, Western Mass and the South Shore and the North Shore where I live, I mean, we could all be much more connected. You would have an exchange of ideas and tourism and everything else that would bring us closer together as a community. And, you know, I think about, we, I was a history and a language major. And you know, Leonardo da Vinci was drawing pictures of airplanes in the 1400s. And, and, and we sit here and say we can't do it. We can't build high-speed rail. We can't get off foreign oil that we subsidize five times that we subsidize renewables. That is so untrue and un-American. We can do it. We just don't have the political will. And the people want it. And we will do it if we want. Great. Well, the fact is, King, I think we're going to wrap up okay. this conversation. All right. All right. Um, um, now we have, I want. To, well, everybody's <laughs> had at least one round. Um, I'm going to ask you for a single letter again. One of these letter grades. We're loving these letter grades. Single syllable response to this question. From A to F, A through F. You can pick one. Um, grade President Obama on his handling of the economy. C plus. C. Um, Senator Brown has straddled the political and the ideological uh, spectrum since he has been elected and on many issues. Some would argue that this strengthens him among independents who will decide this race and that it shows that he can work on both sides of the aisle. Why do you think you could better represent Massachusetts and better represent um, the independents? Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I have been saying this for the last eight months and that I resonate with independents because I have real world on the ground experience advocating and fighting for people's rights and their jobs. I represent small businesses. I am a small business. I know what it's like to look at a balance sheet every month and at the beginning of every year and you start from zero. And a lot of independents on the North Shore and throughout Massachusetts are supporting me. I get a common line. I lean Republican. I'm registered independent. But I like you. I don't agree with everything you say. But you say what you mean and you mean what you say. And I can absolutely represent Independence the best, better than Scott Brown, and all of the people of Massachusetts because I have that on-the-ground experience and know what it takes to advocate for people's rights. And, and you can work I, with Republicans? I could, yeah. I work with the federal government, Department of Homeland Security, and sat on liaison committees, so they don't just let uh, anybody do that. So I, I do have six, five brothers and sisters, so I do play well with others, yep. too. <laughs> Please. Yes, thank I, you. Um, one of Senator Ted Kennedy's greatest regrets was that he was unable to get comprehensive immigration reform through the Senate. What deal would you be willing to, to accept in order to achieve that goal? I can I uh, start backwards because I'm going to say before, because if you don't do immigration reform, the one thing you need to do in conjunction with that is trade reform. So if we continue, and shame on Democrats who voted for the Korean and the Panama and the Colombian Free Trade Act, because what will happen 
is you can have the best immigration reform in the world, but if you do not have trade reform, what's going to happen is the same thing that happened to Mexico when we passed NAFTA. So you know that giant sucking sound that happened to our jobs in America. Well, in Mexico, NAFTA also killed their economy because the U.S. and Canada were allowed to subsidize our agribusinesses, not our family farmers, and flood the Mexican market with cheap corn exports. What happened? It threw two million corn farmers out of work in the early 90s. Oh, by the way, we had an uptick in undocumented immigration across the border. You think those two things were related? Of course they are. So no Democrat should be voting for these, trade, these uh, so-called free trade, which is just bad trade policy. But on immigration reform, we're going to do a few things. We are going to have some kind of system for essential workers to come here and be matched with employers because right now you cannot come into this country unless you have a bachelor's degree, and even at that, the numbers are limited. So we are shooting ourselves in the foot by not bringing in talent in engineering and physics and math and chefs and across the board different industries, people that I work with, nurses and social workers and preschool teachers. That is my on-the-ground experience. But you can't bring in a lot of essential workers. You can't even bring in... Um, you can't bring in, um, you know, masons and, and people who have very high-tech uh, skills in the labor fields. The other thing we are going to do is we are going to legalize, legalize, not grant amnesty to the 11 million people that are here because it is our corporations that brought them here. It is our corporations that exploit them. It is our bad policy that, with NAFTA and everything else that has brought them here. And yes, they broke a civil law. They did not break a criminal law. And we are not deporting people like we did under the Chinese Exclusion Acts from the years of 1882 to 1941, the one race that we wrote into the law that was deportable and excludable in this country because that is an ugly history and we are not going back to that. And we are going to make them pay a fine, you know, whether it's $4,000 or $5,000, because currently if you want a green card, fees alone are going to cost you about $3,000. So we're going to up the penalty a little bit. They're going to have to learn English. They're going to take government tests, and we are going to legalize them. And then we are going to have a restructuring of our immigration so we can match employers to workers and have an orderly system with trade reform. And, sorry, one more thing. We are going to write the sexism out of asylum law because that is one part where I work in, the sexism and the heterosexism. Because I won two big cases this year on gender asylum for a family of women fleeing sex trafficking and for a gay Ugandan gentleman, both it, one who had been tortured in his country for being gay and the other women fleeing sex trafficking. And why is it so hard for those, case, those people to win those cases? Because they are not recognized in our law as a separate group. We do not recognize women as its own group and we do not recognize LGBT people as their own group. And we, that is an easy fix and we can do that because we are the United States of America and we don't send Thank people you. home to be persecuted. Thanks, Mr. Farka. Marissa's the act. As briefly and um, as candidly as you can, um, in poll after poll, Harris, Pew, you name it, income inequality has become a very real issue in public life. Uh, what, if anything, can you do as a U.S. Senator in terms of policy uh, to affect the widening gap between the richest 1 percent and the 99 percent? We tax, we tax um, income, but we do not tax wealth. And so I would support something like Jan Schakowsky's plan that has an upper level, I, I believe, something of 42%. And you know what? No one loves paying taxes, but if you're making a couple million dollars a year, I'd love to make a couple million dollars a year and pay 42% of taxes if it means I'm going to get safe work environments for the workers and high-speed rail and green energy and all of the things that we need to do. And the other thing, income inequality, how about a little bit of worker rights? How about that word union? I checked my dictionary this morning, Philip. Indeed, union is a five-letter word, not a four-letter word. <laughs> and any Democrat that shies away from saying it and saying that unions built the middle class. My grandfather was a union worker at the GE for 40 years. But you know what? When he retired, it was nice, but he was not as rich as the GE CEO. And why is that? We've gone from 40 to 1 to 400 to 1. You know, somebody making $40,000 on the factory floor, make, and in the 60s, the CEO was making 1.6. Now, well, sorry, 1.6. 1, 1. Now they're making 16 million. 
That is completely ludicrous. We have reverse Robin Hood, where the 1% steals all of the money and the productivity that the 99% produces, and they charge us with class warfare. I'm not taking any kind of guff like that from the Republicans. <laughs> and, and, and two other points. Two other points. Democrats never talk about, how about minimum wage? We had to wait 10 years to get an increase in minimum wage, and who can live on that anyhow? Nobody. We need to start talking about a livable wage, because if you don't have workers in a factory or on the farm or in the organization or in the corporation, you don't have an entity. And they are the businesses, and they are the corporations. Without workers, we have nothing. And it's about time that they got that kind of respect. And lastly, I'm the only candidate on record on, in support of single payer. And that does affect in income inequality. <laughs> because my father's a retired doctor, my mother's a retired nurse, and if we don't do something, health care is going to be the entire percentage of our GDP, 100%, a couple decades down the road. And if we don't get real about it, if we started giving, if we had single payer, and people had good preventative health care for the first 40 years of their lives, Guess what we'd also do? We'd bring the cost of Medicare down because people wouldn't be as sick. So, um, okay. so, that, so I support single payer, and it helps to grow. Thank you. It helps to grow jobs because as a small business, if you decouple health care from employment, you would see jobs flourish. I would hire a person if I didn't have to worry about health care. I'm sure the gym would hire more people, and every small business would love to hire more people if it weren't for that monstrosity called. Health care, but really it's health business in this country, and we need to turn it back to health care. Uh, moving to foreign policy. Uh, many people believe that China right now is our greatest threat economically as well as politically. Some believe that we need a more confrontational approach, enforcing them to stop manipulating their currency, and some are accusing them of stealing our intellectual property freely, both of which is costing Americans jobs. Um, do you agree, and if not, what specifically do you propose yeah, that we should speak be speak directly to your question. Yes, we can get tougher with China, and people will say, we can't do that because then they'll call in their loans. Call their bluff. China is not going to call in their loans because you know why? Because our consumer economy is holding up their economy, and that is the beginning and the end of the story. And yes, I would support terrorists, but you know who else is also complicit in this? Our U.S. conglomerates and U.S. corporations. So if they want to continue shipping jobs overseas, and they want to keep calling themselves U.S. corporations and get all the tax breaks that we give them, then we are going to have a re-importation re tariff on their goods. They want to compete in a market, then they're going to compete in a real market. I have to follow up on that. My in-laws fled communist China. And so you know a little bit about the, how the Chinese operate, and you have to be tough. And we can't play with kid gloves. And if they want to be tough, then we have to be tough back. And yes, we have to deal with them. But and I deal with them all the time in the U.S. consulates abroad, in the embassies, and people that come over from China. So I have a lot of experience with China, foreign policy, and economics. Uh, I just also we, just, you would be willing to possibly look at it. Occupy yes. protesters be allowed to build winterized structures on public land. No one's going to say yes or no. I, when you say that everyone has to follow the law, it, it actually bothers me because it makes a presumption that people are breaking the law. No, it doesn't. No, it, it does. Doesn't. Well, let me finish. And you know what? Rosa Parks broke the law. There is such a thing called, as a tradition in this country, as civil disobedience. And the women who wanted suffrage standing, out, standing outside, Wilson didn't want to hear from them. They went on hunger, hunger strikes. And they protested and they protested and they protested, as did the civil rights protesters when Bull Connor was releasing the fire hoses on them in the streets of Birmingham. So, you know, when the, when the 99 percent is losing everything, their pensions and their 401ks and their jobs and their lives, and we can't allow people to be in the streets peaceably, peaceably, and if they want to stay there, it's called a sit-in. And yes, they should be allowed as long as they are peaceful and they are protesting. Violence, absolutely not. Okay, no, I got a no yes. Do tolerance. I hear a yes or no? They have to be in the streets yeah, yeah. because their homes are being foreclosed on and people are being rendered homeless because, again, the banks broke the laws and stole our money and did nothing right. Well, <laughs> we found it. <laughs> this, this is a very friendly uh, collection of, of competitors. Um, but allow me to mention the, the elephant in the room. 
Uh, Professor Warren's entry into this race was hotly anticipated, was promoted by party officials and activists both in the state and nationwide, in name recognition, media attention, and in the polls, and in fundraising. She is miles ahead of the field. Uh, this is a question to the other four candidates. What do you see as her vulnerabilities and how can you change the dynamics <laughs> in this race? Look, I have said over and over again, I've posted on my Facebook, I've posted on my website, money is not going to win this race. The Democrat could raise $10 million and Scott Brown is going to raise $20 million. And the Democrat, 20, and Scott Brown, 40. When we play the money game, we are already conceding because we are playing on the Republicans' turf. And I'm sorry, but funding the Democratic race by the 1% in Soros versus the Koch brothers, that's not a brilliant strategy, and that is not what was going to win the race. So you fund the race by the top 1% on both sides, and the 99% loses. People are going to decide this race. And a poll comes out, and by the way, they only did a poll with Elizabeth's name and not the rest of us against Scott Brown. And there was some polling done earlier by the Herald that was a little more um, realistic. And everybody's, you know, wetting their pants. I mean, really, <laughs> as a Hillary supporter and a Martha supporter, they knocked on the doors and made the phone calls, ask those two what a poll means this early in the race. And so what Democrats need to do is get real and get out of the elite fundraising world and start talking to people on the ground. And the people I'm talking to on the North Shore and Western Mass and Central Mass and in the businesses and to independents, and that is what is going to win the race. So forget about the money because we are not ever ever going to have enough money as the Koch brothers. And shame on us as Democrats if we can't be more bold, less linear. So just pick a candidate, raise $10 million, and put them out there. That's, that's not creative. That's not imaginative and, imaginative, and that is not bold. Pick a candidate who stands strong on the issues. I'm for single payer. I talk about unions and workers' okay. rights. I have w work, women's rights background. On point. On the ground experience. That's my strength. As better than anyone else. I'm really looking for a very, very short yes or no question from each, yes or no answer from both, all of you. We've all been hearing about casino gambling. We know that a law has been signed and, and uh, it's coming. Casinos are coming to Massachusetts. Do you think the bill that was passed by the legislature, signed by the governor, was a good deal for Massachusetts taxpayers? Mr. Franco? Mr. Franco. I don't think it's a good deal. It's short term gain for long-term loss. But I really have to say something about Iran if we're not going to ask that question, because I want to go on the record. Unlike other candidates, we do take options off the table. We take nuclear war off the table. We take troops off the ground off the table. I appreciate your platform, but with Iran. I don't think it's fair to the other candidates, to be honest with you. Mr. King, where do you stand on casino gambling? 